Welcome everybody. I'm Deborah Tomlinson with Inside the Vatican Magazine, and we welcome you today to our Inside the Vatican Writers Chat. Today we have a very special guest and a friend of Inside the Vatican, Dr. Robert Royal, and we have Chris Deirdrift, the assistant editor of Inside the Vatican Magazine, and Dr. Robert Moynihan, the founder and editor-in-chief of Inside the Vatican Magazine, who will be leading our discussion today with Dr. Royal. So without any further delay, I'd like to turn it over to Christine Deirdre. Chris? Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. We're glad to have you with us. So as Deborah said, I'd, uh, we'd like to welcome Dr. Robert Royal. He's the uh, author and TV commentator. Um, he's the president of the Faith and Reason Institute in Washington, DC, editor at the Catholic Thing website, as well as a frequent guest on EWTN's The World Over as a member of the Papal Posse. And most recently he was, um, appointed by Thomas More College of the Liberal Arts in New Hampshire as the St. John Henry Newman Chair of Catholic Studies. And he's the inaug inaugural uh, holder of that seat. So congratulations on that too, that's great. Um, I guess I'd like to start by asking you about the theme of your latest book. It's called Columbus and the Crisis of the West, uh, published by Sophia Institute Press um, besides defending Columbus the man, I'd say your underlying theme is defending Western civilization itself and its understanding and belief in itself. So I'd like to ask you, what exactly do you mean by the crisis of the West? And in particular, how is it affecting the Roman Catholic Church in your opinion? Well, this is a very good question, and a lot of my work, several of my books have dealt, you know, kind of broadly with this theme. I look at the, I, I wrote a book, my very first book was about Columbus in 1992, and that was the 500th anniversary, the 500th year after those first voyages in 1492. And there was all, already a kind of a troubling, it seemed to me, anti-Western perspective that was starting to creep into the conversations. It wasn't as it is today. I mean, I gave a lecture on October 12, 14, uh, 1992 at Princeton. 150 people were there. You know, it was a normal academic lecture. Some people criticized some things I said, some supported or added other things, but it was a normal academic debate. I walked out of there, it was normal. Today, that couldn't happen. Today, as we know, because of the, the heightened polarity in, in our politics and our culture, even in our religious views, uh, it probably would be impossible for any group at Princeton to invite me to, to give a lecture there about Columbus that would not entirely defend him, because there are things that I think that he, he, he was inadequate to dealing with, mm -hmm. but that you know, broadly looks at him and says he's an admirable figure and tries to defend not only him, but the way that he has become a symbol for our Western civilization, of our American civilization, and also I think we have to say, frankly, of Christianity coming to the new world. Because those three things, I think, are under, they're under direct and indirect attack. And in, in, in attacking him, I think many people, without knowing with anything about him personally at all, really are reacting to things that they believe they don't like in our culture right now, and they, they want to trace back to the origins of Christianity and Western civilization and European civilization in the Americas. So that's a long answer for your, your mm -hmm. point of question. But I really think that the term crisis is not too strong because we've really gotten so self-critical, you know, canceling Columbus Day, um, replacing it with an Indigenous Peoples Day, attacking Thomas Jefferson, Washington, even Lincoln now is not politically correct. There, there, this, there's nothing wrong with self-criticism. That's really a strong part of our Western tradition. But when self-criticism gets so radical and so pervasive that it essentially, it essentially tries to undo the foundations, which are both religious and secular, we're getting pretty close to what I, I would also call social, not only a crisis, but even kind of a cultural suicide. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and um, how do you see this uh, rearing its head in the Catholic Church? And I, I'm, um, 
want to connect this maybe a little bit also to uh, things that have happened recently, bad things that have happened recently in, in Europe. There were, there were church stabbings in Nice, uh, beheading of a teacher in Paris, and these things happening right in the, in the bosom of Christian Europe, as it were, and we're not even really that surprised that these things are happening. And I'm just wondering if you, if you see some kind of connection between our, our, uh, the West uh, losing its uh, belief in itself and understanding in its, of itself and these things that are uh, increasingly happening in, in the, uh, as I said, the bosom of Christian Europe. Yeah, you know, there's an old Jewish saying, if I am not for myself, who am I for? Uh, if we can't defend our own civilization, even with all the flaws that we know that existed, and we can be honest about that. But if we can't really defend the fundamentals of our civilization, then I, I really grow, grow quite pessimistic about what the future is going to be. Look, it's not only the Columbus statues have been pulled down or that um, people have tried to pull down statues of figures like uh, Teddy Roosevelt and others. We've seen this spate of statue attacks against um, statues of the Blessed Virgin Mary, um, the, the various shrines that have been established around the country, the whole mission system that gave birth to California uh, mm -hmm. with, with uh, Junipero Serra. Um, I think this is all part and parcel of that, that saying, what you right, rightly point to, it's a lack of confidence in our own history. And see, for Christians, it is not surprising that we look at any figure and we find out that they're flawed. We know that we are all sinners. We all think we exist in a fall, fallen world, that history at any period is going to show imperfections and even deep evils. But to be able to hold that view, that, that view of, of human imperfection and fallenness, and at the same time to celebrate those things that make it possible for us to try to respond. I take Jefferson as an example. So Jefferson was a slave owner. And we don't celebrate him because he was a slave owner. We celebrate him because he said in the Declaration of Independence that we hold that we hold it as self-evident that men have been endowed by their creator. This is a Judeo-Christian concept. There's no other civilization in the world that says in its foundation that we have all been made in the limb, in the image and likeness of God. And so the impact on the church, and specifically Catholicism, because Catholicism is really the only Christian cultural force. The evangelicals are they're fairly strong in this country, but globally, the, the Catholic Church is really the only force that can stand up to this um, overwhelmingly anti-Western and even within the West sort of uh, suicidal anti-Western current that we're seeing everywhere. Okay. Um... I, uh, we, we've taken some uh, questions ahead of time and a couple of them were asking about your, um, the class you're teaching at Thomas More, which is titled with an apocalyptic title, Apocalypses, Plagues, Utopias, and Dystopias. And also I noticed your last two or three articles have also had a sort of apocalyptic uh, tone. So I'm just wondering if you can explain why. <laughs> Well, you put your finger on the crux of the, <laughs> the matter. Yeah, when they first asked me back in the spring if I would accept this, it, and it's a visiting chair, they have a donor who wants uh, not to, to support ongoing faculty, but to bring in people on, on a semester or year long basis and do something at the college that they couldn't otherwise do. So it's a great book school and it focuses on, you know, kind of Western civilization in the first two years. And the upper level class, I mean, I have the largest uh, course being taught among the upper level students. Mm -hmm. But I thought about, you know, what could I bring? To and so many of us feel these days, not only in America, but all over the world, that so, so many things seem to be going wrong. The Holy Father has talked about us being on the brink. Um, uh, my friend Rod Dreher, who lives down in, in Louisiana, says his mother was just an old Southern Louisiana lady, says, Rod, we in Revelations, you know. <laughs> I said to myself, why don't we read Revelations? Why don't we read the book of the Apocalypse and see what scripture? And yet this is the last book of scripture. It's not an easy book to read, but let's look at it and see what it says about the end times and where is history going and you know, what kind of good and evil forces, spiritual forces are going to be at, at play. And then what I wanted to look at as a, as, as a number of texts where you can kind of see things playing out. We read Albert Camus' The Plague. 
I mean, obviously we've got the Wuhan virus in America and the world right now. And, and here's a, an interesting novel by a, a Nobel Prize winner about a plague in his home country of Algeria and how it, it affects people. And there's a Catholic priest who preaches on it and there are humanists and there are various you know, positions. And I wanted the students to be able to kind of sort through some of that in relation, some of that apocalyptic, uh, those concepts uh, in relationship to something like a plague that's going on now. And then we're reading other books, like we just read Lord of the World, which is a favorite of Pope Francis's, in which mm -hmm. um, th there's kind of a final confrontation between a global religion of humanity and the Catholic Church, which, as, as I was saying earlier, is really the only Christian force that can kind of stand up to this non-Christian uh, emerging culture. And then we, you know, we're going to read other uh, books. We're reading uh, uh, Invisible Man by uh, Ralph Ellison, which is about the Black experience of trying to overcome slavery and the aspiration toward something better. And then the kind of dystopias that even come out of the efforts to try to build something good. And we're going to finish with Walker Percy's Love and Ruins, which I just think is a funny, funny novel about all sorts of crazy things. You know, there's, that's a novel in which actually a doctor thinks he's invented a device that will reverse the fall of man. So <laughs> students, the students are already looking forward to, you know, to, to that ending. But we've had, some, we've had some great discussions. I love the kids up there. They're just bright and they're engaged. And, um, you know, maybe a, a little bird whispered in my ear this apocalyptic uh, topic that kind of it, it gathers together a lot of things that are of interest right now. Very good, okay. Uh, another question that we received was about uh, on the topic of enculturation and in, uh, specifically it was speaking about the Irish church and the press seems to be encouraging uh, a kind of enculturation that blends Celtic traditions, which include paganism uh, with Catholicism. And I'm wondering if you could speak to this phenomenon uh, in particular, if not in particular, uh, the push for enculturation in general and in, in the church as it's playing out in various places around the world. Amazonia is one example, obviously. And how do we discern what is good and not good in this? And how big of a problem is it? Is it even uh, that big of a problem? What do you think? Well, I think there was a lot of enculturation from the very beginning in, in the in the Irish church. I think there were elements of that. You go to, to a church in Ireland and they're just elements of, of kind of the Celtic past that I think really shine through. Mm -hmm. um, look, enculturation is a very difficult thing. Let's recognize that to begin with. I think the whole Pachamama uh, uh, debacle in Rome was a disaster. That, that image should not have been used on Vatican grounds. It should certainly not have been in churches there. This is a pagan goddess. I mean, let's just say this you know, outright. It is a, a goddess of fertility and some other things in various um, South American cultures. That's the kind of thing that you confront early on in, the, in a period of, of uh, missionary work. Okay. So for example, Our Lady of Guadalupe has you know, many features that, that resemble those of a, a, an indigenous woman of that period but also mixed with something from, that comes from the outside as well. The early uh, North American martyrs, they just celebrated their, uh, their feast day a couple of weeks ago, the, the Jesuits, Marquette, you know, and others who came to, to the, uh, the New World. They had to look at, at native cultures and say, you know, how do I, how do I explain baptism? You know, is there something about water in this culture that I can begin to talk about with them? Now that's all fine. I mean, that, that it seems to me is the way our Lord's actually spoke even to the Jews. He had to teach them something new while still affirming what their culture and what their, their past had been. Where I start to get very nervous is we know that in the modern world, there are pagan resurgences, I would call them. You know, we don't use the names of Zeus and Venus and whatnot, but we know that there's a kind of a sexual goddess emerging who is being worshipped in many advanced yeah. cultures. We know that, that there's a kind of a worship of mammon, of, of just sheer wealth, of power, etc. And so what, when we talk about these things in the developed world, I, I, think, um, I think we've been through that already. Anyway, I, I'm all for opening up to 
you know, looking more carefully at nature. I wrote a whole book about religion and environmentalism. I think that the church has something to say that's of, of use about environmentalism. But when we take our main energies from outside instead of from within our tradition and from Christ himself, frankly, then I, I think we're skirting very close to, to playing with fire in terms of, of paganism, of worshiping false idols. The, the, the whole energy has got to be to move people from those partial truths, because there are partial truths in, in paganism. And, and this happened in the ancient world, the Greco-Roman world. We have to move them from that. The, the traffic has to move in the direction of the church. So can't, the church can't even appear to be supine sort of toward these, these external cultural manifestations, which ultimately are not really fully uh, uh, concordant with the gospel. Okay. Uh, another uh, question that came up a few times in different forms was, uh, given the fact that Christianity and in particular Catholicism is being attacked on so many fronts uh, in, in our own neighborhoods, right? Even our, even our uh, you know, our neighbors are uh, saying and doing crazy things. How do everyday Catholics, what can we do to defend Christendom against the barbarians who live next door? <laughs> Any of them. <laughs> they, do. They, they do everywhere, you're, you're right. <laughs> right about this. Uh, you know, I often say to people, if you're gonna cancel or reject every person who did not line up exactly with what the woke culture is right now in the history of the world, you're gonna re reject virtually everyone because there's no culture outside of the West that say accepts gay marriage the way we do now, or I mean, even women's rights, I think the, the way we do right now. And uh, not to be political about this, but just to take a pointed example, Joe Biden and, and uh, Barack Obama, I don't think we're fully on board with, at least publicly, with gay marriage until you know, after the second, the, in, into the second Obama uh, administration. So what, are we going to go back and look at them at the way we look at Lincoln said that Lincoln wasn't entirely perfect in the way he regarded black people? Are we going to say this even about figures like Obama and, and Biden? Because, you know, for many years they opposed, so, you know, some of them, Biden opposed abortion and, and, uh, and gay rights and gay marriage and, you know, on and on and on. Um, look, we have to find a way to live with one another. This is what the, the people who oppose us say all the time. And that means when I disagree with you, I don't simply um, regard you as, as just trash that can be ignored and thrown away. We all live in this society together. And so we must engage in a conversation together, a rational conversation. I did a TV show about Columbus a couple of weeks ago. And the host of the TV show was a black man, a Southern black man. And, you know, we were sparring about this and that, about the, the history of the United States. And he said, you know, I don't know, maybe my family would have been better off if they would have been left in Africa. And I said, no, absolutely not. You know, what we are doing right now, this exchange that we're having, where, you know, you tell me what you think, and I tell you what I think, and try to at least find some common ground so we can live together. That's the beauty of what this country has always been. We, we're not all Catholic or Protestant or Jewish or Muslim or whatever, but we can find a way to at least uh, live in a, in a reasonably tolerant way with one another. We're going to disagree. Mm -hmm. But what we're facing right now is a, something that is, if not exactly totalitarian, a kind of a soft tyranny that, is, that demands. I mean, we see this in the way people are forced in their companies to subscribe to all kinds of things that don't seem to have anything to do with the economic activity of the country, that the company, we see it in the way that anti-racism now has become so extreme that just to be a white person or maybe even to be a christian is to be somehow biased to have some kind of unconscious uh prejudice i, I think that this is very very dangerous because if, if you can look at me walking around in the street and say you're a white person and therefore you are guilty in a serious way not just you know you're you're kind of vaguely guilty of what happened in the past and you're, you're benefiting from it you can say that I'm guilty right now, or you're guilty, or any of, or you know, conversely, a black person is guilty because there's high crime in your neighborhood, or you know, whatever. This is not who we are. We believe we're all made in the image and likeness of God. We believe that we are all rational beings. 
and we must engage with, with one another and, and not try to cancel one another. I don't know how to, you know, when people ask me, what do I do in my neighborhood? I can't tell you. And, mm -hmm. and at times there's nothing you can do. There's, there's nothing you can do with people who don't want to listen to anything other than what they themselves want to say. But where that's possible, I think you prudently, prayerfully, but confidently try to set forward some different ideas and engage people. And you know, ultimately, this stuff is open to God. It's, it's up to God to open people's hearts and minds so mm -hmm. that we can exchange ideas without hating one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Um, I do want to go back and touch the issue of migration again one more time. Um, uh, it's it seems problematic uh, in Europe that there are so many um, Muslims there. And like I, uh, I just alluded to earlier, uh, violence that's happening against Christians, Catholics especially, because they're the, vis the uh, vi most visible religious group, I guess, Christian group. Um, how are we to reconcile these phenomena with Pope Francis's injunction to welcome the migrant in imitation of the Good Samaritan, his latest encyclical, Retali Tutti, which tells the rich, richer nations to open up their borders um, to migration from people from the poorer nations? And certainly, you know, that's the biblical injunction to, to uh, to welcome, welcome the poor and the suffering. So how do we reconcile all of these, the problems on the one hand and, and uh, what we feel our faith calls us to do and the church calls us to do on the other? Look, I, I would draw a distinction between immigration policies and the need to welcome the stranger. Um, immigration policies have to take into account the country that that is receiving the immigration as well as the country from which the immigration has come. And it's precisely because of the problems that have been created by Mus mostly Muslim immigration going into Europe. We, we've, we have some problems with Latin American immigration into the United States, but we're used to dealing with immigration. We, prior to the COVID uh, crisis, we normally let in a million legal immigrants a year. That, that's far from being xenophobic. We welcome immigrants, they, they enrich the country, they, they, they provide us with an opening to other countries that is very good for us as a world leader. But there's a difference between that kind of immigration and the, the religious injunction to welcome the stranger, take care, take care of the stranger. Jesus did not say you can't have borders to your country. He did not say that, that you cannot have an immigration, a set of immigration policies. I remember when, when the situation was getting, you know, Pope Francis has said from the very beginning, I mean, one of the first things he did when he was elected is he went to the island of Lampedusa, which is very close to the African coast. It's owned by Italy, but it's very close to the African coast. And he, he was promoting migration even then. Italy already has 6 million poor people, uh, native born Italians. And, you know, the, the leadership has, has recognized that when you already have a poor population, and especially now when we've got the, the, the virus that's shut down our economies and whatnot, you can't, there, there are other considerations that welcoming the stranger does not, does not um, cancel all your other responsibilities as a country to take care of your own people and to, and to, and to make sure that the culture of the country is, is stable. You know, when, when cultures start to destabilize, and, and you see in France, France is a very, uh, very proud of its traditions. And you see that even when there are a few things around the edges that start to happen in France, it really shakes up the French because they really believe that their tradition of what they call laïcité, the, the secularism, embraces everybody. This, this shouldn't happen. It should be possible to embrace everybody. But what if you embrace people who don't accept secularism and, and they, they form significant groups within your society? This is something that I think they're, they're beginning to rethink in a very serious way because it, it, this, it's that thing that has to balance. Yes, help people who are in distress and any decent person will wanna do that. But that does not mean you have to open your borders to every, everyone. I think one of the things I learned during the youth synod a couple of years ago in the Vatican is that a lot of migration takes place within 
developing countries. In Africa, for example, most of the migration, we think that it goes from Africa to Europe, most of it occurs within countries in Africa. And the, the question that was put during the youth synod is, what if all your young people leave a country? What if the, you know, the dynamic, um, you know, young, ambitious people all move to Europe? Well, what happens to the home country if that takes place? So that's another responsibility. You just don't automatically say, yeah, that's great. Everybody wants to come, let them come. These are complex issues. And I wish the Holy Father would say more. He has said occasionally, um, a country has to think through how many people it can accept and, and accept as many as it can. Well, okay, that's fine. They, they, you know, a country can a actually have a, a rational discussion by its citizenry, by its, its elected officials about you know, what's the best thing for both the people who want to come here and our own society, which is, our, you know, our, our elected leaders, are, their primary responsibility is for our people. So there are multiple parts of this. And, and um, I don't like it when we just conflate a, a good gospel principle of welcoming the stranger and, and assuming that that gives us a policy prescription for immigration. That's not, that's not the way a Catholic should think. It's a much more complicated and necessarily complicated set of circumstances. So, um, Christina, talking can I, can oh, go I, ahead. Are you there, I, Bob? I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, I've been interested in everything you've said, Dr. Royal. I almost feel like it would be nice to take your class. <laughs> That's next week, Bob. We'll, we'll put that on, the, on this spot uh, next week. We can start that. Um, yeah, I, I studied the writing of Walker Percy. I've been running selections from Lord of the World in the magazine. Somehow our thoughts seem to run along the same lines. Uh, and you mentioned Pope Francis and you are a member of what is called the Papal Posse. So you're somehow rounding up the Pope, I guess. But I <laughs> wonder if you could explain you, Jared, Father Murray, and Raymond DeRoyo, on a major Catholic network, have set yourselves up to look at the Pope and talk about the papacy. How did that start? How has it gone? And how do you see it now? Well, I'm going to tell a few deep secrets of EWTN. <laughs> Actually, we all started, we covered the conclave in 2013 in which um, Francis was elected. Uh, and actually, we had another member, Father Roger Landry, who now works at the Holy See Mission at the UN. And so he can't really be part of a public discussion on, on EWTN the way that we are. So we were back then the conclave crew. That's what we were called, the four of us. And um, a couple of months after the Pope had been elected and we were going to do a show uh, from the studios here in Washington, DC, uh, we started rolling and it was live on camera. So there wasn't anything any, that Father and I could do about this. And Raymond said, you know, it's been a couple of months since the conclave. We can't really be the conclave crew anymore. Henceforth, we shall be the papal posse. Father Murray and I looked at each other and said, hmm. Uh, and what could we do? It was on live TV. But I would, Bob, I would just make one qualification. You know, Leonardo DiCaprio has a posse. They're, they're his crew. You know, so when, he, when we, we're... When we're feeling good about what the Pope is doing, we're, I think we're supporting him and we're, we're supporting him in a way it, when, when we bring forward some ideas that we think need to be considered that maybe aren't being considered in Rome. But as you know, I mean, this has kind of taken off on its own and it's become this big, uh, I think it's the biggest uh, segment on, on uh, EWTN right now. So it had, it's had a lot of influence. I, you know, I come out of churches in Italy and England and whatnot, and people say, you look like that guy I see in the paper policy. <laughs> You know, we're very careful. Our, our, we, I think our criticisms, um, you know, people just assume that we're anti-Pope Francis. I don't think that that's true. I think we've said some, you know, positive things about him. I said, no, certainly I have. Uh, and I get mail from people when I say positive things that I'm being naive and, you know, I'm, I'm giving into the devil, you know, how the internet is these days. But uh, there is a conversation. Francis is an unusual Pope and we're not the only ones who are feeling that, you know, be, maybe it's because we have this instantaneous mode of communication now, the internet that the popes in Rome, you know, they whisper something in a corridor and the next thing you know, it's in every nook and cranny of the entire globe. So um, 
I guess we're going to, this is the kind of church, this is one of the elements of the church that we're going to have going forward, that, that we're going to be in a, a constant discussion. I think Francis has not served himself well. He, he's not a, a particularly good speaker um, on his feet, and he's said that a number of times. And, you know, there are only two people on the face of the earth whose every word really counts. It's the president of the United States, because he can start a nuclear war, and it's the Pope of Rome. And... Um, things that we, maybe it was okay to say when you were the Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires, sometimes it's not ideal to say as the Bishop of Rome. Um, you know, you've talked now about very important matters concerning the Pope, and people talk about divisions in the church and concerns that the Pope may not have chosen the right word or said the right thing, something that 50 years ago people hardly would would think of. Um, there's a number of questions. Do you think there's a danger of the church splitting into a more conservative group and a more progressive group? Can we hold together? Have we already in some way split, but it's just the appearance of unity? And then are conservatives and liberals who love the church able to talk and and come to uh, a truly Catholic conclusion? Yeah, this is a big question, of course. Uh, I myself, if you just asked me yes or no, are we headed towards schism, I would say no. And my, my one caveat about that is we see that in Germany, there seems to be some kind of impulse toward going their own way. And the Holy Father has actually been very strong in trying to reel in those um, assumptions that the bishops in a particular country um, can take off in a different direction than the universal church. And I think that that shows that he himself is trying to hold as, as much as we can uh, hold things together. I've got to say, I mean, you and I are both longtime veterans of, I think we've probably known each other 30 years, and we longtime veterans of um, debates going on inside the church, that probably in the last 10 years or so, things have become more polarized even with, inside the church, even prior to, to Francis, uh, than they were earlier. It's not only in politics and in, in, in public life in the West that polarization has become a serious problem, I mean, very, very stark polarization. But for me, I, I think even though I, don't, I am not myself as engaged in conversations with people on, if we wanna say this, the other side, as much as in the past, um, I think that there still is, common ground. There still is some, some loyalty to the institution, some capacity at least to, even if we're raising our voices slightly toward one another, I don't think we've gotten to the point of what you see on the internet uh, on a regular basis on social media. Now that could change, of, of course. But for now, I, I think that there's still enough, I mean, we all know that there's a secular threat out there. Liberals and conservatives in the church, for example, know that things like materialism, consumerism, uh, you know, even environmental challenges, as much as conservatism, I try to deny the more extreme views on environmentalism. There are a number of issues uh, outside of the church that hold us together. And in terms of, you know, those hot button issues like gays and um, you know, married uh, priests and, and, and women deacons and whatnot, those are, gonna, those are conversations that are gonna go on for a while. I don't think those will lead to a split, but you know, maybe I'm being Pollyannish. I mean, cer certainly we've got things going on in the church that 50 years ago were not. Do you have any judgment of the trajectory of Archbishop Vigano? Yeah, I think um, for me, I'm, I, I think he should not be speaking quite so much. And the, the most recent letter that he just sent to, to uh, President Trump, I think it came out last night or today, Yes, I, I think, um, yeah, it took, to me, there's a conspiracy theory there that's not entirely wrong, that the currents that he's concerned about, I think, are all out there, and they kind of crisscross uh, among various groups. But he, to me, he gives the impression of, you know, there is something like um, the president of the uh, religion of humanity and Lord of the world. And I don't think that that's quite right. I, I think that the devil is having a great time right now. 
And I'm like, I'm waiting for 2020 to come to an end because the 2020 has been you know, one of these years that we're all going to look back and say, wow, we even survived that, didn't we? But other than the devil himself, I don't see a coordinated conspiracy. You know, people talk about the Pope being part of this globalist. And he denies a number of things that, that people say about him. Now, he also does say worrisome things. It, it seems that he implies that um, that all, all kinds of religions can be valid in some sense, and he never clarifies this. And of course, this really gets down to the nub of it. If you want to say that we're all tolerant of one another, sure, that's fine. But when it looks as if you're being indifferent to, um, to the various religious commitments that the human race makes, and we believe, of course, as Catholics, that only in Jesus are we saved. Um, the Pope has even said things like no one is saved alone. And of course, that's true. We don't have to be saved uh, as a church. We have to engage one another. But we can be saved alone. I mean, if the whole world were to go, you know, into apostasy, a, a, a human soul could still toward, turn toward God. So that, that, uh, those overgeneralizations and the lack of clarity that sometimes come um, out of Francis's mouth or his writings or whatnot, um, I think that these things are, are the worrisome things for me. Okay, that's one other issue. We've had a kind of corruption and abuse among members of the hierarchy and the clergy. You mentioned before we are in a fallen world and Catholics are very realistic, including about our popes over the centuries. But has something changed with the discipline in the church or the, the way we understand ourselves that has broken? What, are we different than we were in the pre-conciliar church or in the 1950s? Or is this par for the course? Do we need a tremendous renewal and reformation? Or are we uh, not so much in need of that? What would you think? Well, look, you're a medievalist, and you know that in the Middle Ages there were all sorts of corruptions, uh, heretical sects, you know, crazy things going on. And religion, look, religion is a strong energy. It, it drives us to great things, and it drives us to crazy things, I think, at the same time. We're, we happen to be in a period where everything seems to be up in the air and it's one of the reasons why I talk about apocalypses these days. It's not just that they're bad or that things are terrible. They're really, we, we don't even know where to turn. People, people say this to me all the time. Something happens, they say, when is the posse going to be on EWTN? As if the posse is going to solve you know, some great problem in the church. We can, we can talk about these things and clarify them. But uh, yeah, something new has happened. And I, I think Rome has not been particularly good for us in the United States who have this abuse problem. And look, we're still puritanical in America in a variety of ways. We may be puritanical about being woke as opposed to being puritanical about Christianity as we were in the past. But we, we have this kind of public, um, I don't know, moralism, you know, kind of excessive moralism at, at, at times. And we seem to be in a period where that's going on right now. The church needs to resolve this, this question of abuse. And, it, and we need bishops here in the United States to step forward and show that they're doing things, disciplining their own brother bishops when things go wrong. But Rome too has got to act. And you know, just to pick one, I think, glaring example, we still have not got that McCarrick report. It's been two years since this has been announced that something was going to come out. <clears throat> yeah, there are, there yeah, are rumors. Got, there are rumors that it will come out on the 10th of November. So oh, really? In 11 days. Yeah. I, I've said on air that I didn't think it would come out before the American elections. But look, that, that has got to come out and it's going to be painful. There are going to be things that lots of us are going to wish even more had come out because I don't think we're going to get the full story. There's still too many people who are living who are highly influential in Rome that may make sure that they are, they are not part of this pretty sad story. But we've got to start that process. And it may take decades before the church then recovers its moral standing or its spiritual standing. But what's the alternative? The alternative is to allow this thing to fester. And until you get the, the splinter out of the hand, it's going to continue to fester. Hmm. All right, Christina, or anyone else, we're, we're down, we're two thirds of the way through a very interesting 
period of discussion with you. I would love to have someone else ask a question to give I us think, deep. I think Bob, I think Chris has a few more questions. Okay. Actually, just I wanted to um, uh, also go to the subject of China briefly because we did have a question about China and what your opinion of the uh, the Vatican China Accord that was recently renewed is uh, what what the what the signs of the times in China as you have been able to see them indicate and. Um, what you think about it. I think it's a disaster. I, I see it, nothing that the church got from this and everything that the Chinese got from, from the accords. Uh, we, we know that after that was signed that persecution became worse for the church. Churches were torn down, crosses were pulled down. Um, there's the rewriting of the scriptures going on in Christian churches in China. China is a human rights violator and, and particularly it's an anti-religious regime. Um, I don't know why the Vatican felt it necessary to sign that, except maybe in the sense that certain high figures in the Vatican wanted to believe that somehow by meeting the Chinese halfway, it might moderate or turn them away from what they did in the past. It has not. I, I, I know of no evidence that, that shows an improvement of the situation. And I, I think that it's, it's only going to get worse as the Chinese take more and more in hand uh, over there and, and are able to hoodwink the West. We don't hear a lot even from our Catholic, our Catholic journals, let alone secular journals, about what's going on in China. And, and not only towards Christians, toward the you know, Uyghurs, Muslims, you know, there's, there's all this mm -hmm. stuff going on. I don't know why this happened. I do know. I mean, I wrote a book about the 20th century martyrs in 2000. Um, and I gave a copy to, to John Paul II on, on May 7, 2000, which was the day that they had that big celebration at the, um, the Colosseum for all the Christian martyrs of the 20th century. And I remember back then that um, there's a lot of controversy over the Vatican Concordat with the Nazi regime. And I looked at it very carefully as I was writing that book. And they had a rationale. They, they knew that the Nazis were not going to pay much attention to them, but they knew also that they could at least appeal to certain legal um, stipulations that had been built into the, the Concordat. They could at least say publicly, you're supposed to be doing this and you're not doing it. Since this accord is secret to begin with, there's no way for the Vatican even to say, you know, in, in a public way, we asked the Chinese to do this. They said they were doing it. They're not, and even if they want to be indulgent and say, well, we're, we're, we're working on this with them, none of us know anything about this. If there is, if there is uh, uh, any progress, and most of us don't see anything out there, then the Vatican ought to tell us at least where they think that this has gone right. They just have asserted that that's the case when it was renewed a few weeks ago, but... Mm -hmm. You know, where is the evidence for this? I think that this is a disaster for the church and it sets, it sets a bad example for how you deal with, with a totalitarian regimes. So you, cannot, you, you cannot dialogue with them. They, they, they have their, we've seen this everywhere that, that there's, the communist type regimes have gotten into place. There's no dialogue with the Soviet Union. There's no dialogue in China. In China. There's no dialogue in Cuba. They, these are regimes that have an ideology that's opposed to Catholicism and you know, either slowly or quickly or gently or uh, violently, they impose it. And that's been the history everywhere that we've seen. Until the regime changes or falls, this is what we'll see. You know, I, I just wanted to interject and you might criticize me for even saying this, but people in Rome have said that Pope Francis as a Jesuit had this dream of following in the footsteps of Father Matteo Ricci, who went to China in the 1500s and became a member, learned Chinese, became a member of the Mandarin court, rather respected by the Chinese emperor, and seemed to be moving towards a beginning of an entree to convert some of China. And he asked Rome if he could use a certain Chinese version of the liturgy and they refused. He had to use Latin. 
and his mission never really proceeded forward and petered out. And that Pope Francis dreams of being the Jesuit that reopens the China mission. And of course, to say that with 5 million Chinese or 10 million underground Chinese, it's not as if there are no Catholics in China, but that he imagined that given the kind of emptiness, spiritually speaking, in terms of the transcendent that the communist regime presents to the people, he felt that if there would be any more space given to the faith and legitimized in some way by the Chinese government, that the Holy Spirit would act and that 200 million Chinese would be drawn towards Jesus Christ and towards the concept of holiness. And there would be a magnificent conversion in China that would make China perhaps the largest Catholic population in the world. And that this was the thinking behind the China agreement. Yeah, I remember that myself. And, you know, of course we all know about the debate over the what are so-called the Chinese rights. The, 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 to, it's actually the same if, if, if they had been opened up, might have, have converted um, some of the higher echelons in China. Yeah, I mean, that's all well and good. Um, it's good to have aspirations um, to do big things. And, and if that was one of his motivations in agreeing to, a, to this accord with the Chinese, well, okay, that's fine. But, you know, we're, we're realists. We're moral realists as Catholics. We need to see what is the actual outcome of what happens when, when you begin these sorts of negotiations. And, and for me, I mean, maybe you have some other sources of information, but I just have, I keep asking, what did we get out of this? We, you know, what, other than the fact that we're in some kind of uh, conversation with, with the Chinese. Look, I've met with the Chinese, some of the Chinese uh, uh, officials who deal with religion here in Washington, DC. And I've got to say, after 30 years of living in Washington, D.C., and seeing all sorts of scamps and scalawags and liars in our own politics, the Chinese officials were the biggest liars I have ever encountered in Washington, D.C. I mean, they just came in and told us utter nonsense. We, we refuted it factually in one, you know, one way or another. And yet they went on and on and on with, with this, this nonsense. And I have a feeling that they're continuing to do that. And look. Um, you know, you can make the argument that, that he wanted to take a risk, but he's risking, you know, however million people, as you rightly say, who were in the underground church and have heroically resisted over all these years. There's, it's, it's somewhat similar to what happened behind the Iron Curtain during the Cold War, that the, the people who really kept the faith alive were the ones who were willing to suffer, sometimes going into, the, into gulags or the Lao guy, as they call the, the prison camps in, in China. That's really where the faith is. And I would be happy if the Holy Spirit found 200 million Chinese Catholics. But in the meantime, um, I, I think a lot of Chinese look at the Vatican compromising with that regime and maybe don't feel the Vatican is, is, is all that different. Maybe it's, it's already compromised itself in the bad sense with their oppressors. Hello, I'm Deborah Tomlinson with Irby or B Communications. Thank you for watching. Be sure to subscribe to our channel by clicking the red subscribe button and make sure you click that bell and you'll be notified of any new uploads. Also, check out all the links below. There's some discounts for you. Thank you.